Hi, everybody. Really great to have you all here with us. And it's a pleasure to have a chance to kick off what I think is going to be an absolutely fantastic session that we have planned today. My name is Dave Fredrickson. I'm the Executive Vice President of AstraZeneca's Oncology Business Unit. And what that really means is that I've got both the privilege and the responsibility for working together with my colleagues within research and development to make sure that the medicines and the therapies that we are developing in our clinical trials and our pipelines have the opportunity to make it to patients across the globe in the real world. And as we think about where we are moving within the cancer space, and as we think about um, what we're trying to accomplish, we are more and more now talking about the goal being cure. And the ambition that we have is to deliver cure for cancer in the many forms in which it presents itself. And at one point, perhaps that was a goal that might be thought of as audacious or indeed even science fiction. I do think that we find ourselves though at a point in time where it feels that at least for some cancer types, if not many cancer types, that that may well be within reach. But cure is a complicated word. And I think that within that context, we know that there's not only scientific complexities, but emotional complexities. And there's statistics and also a patient that is behind each one of those particular statistics that we have. And so it's with that intent and purpose and spirit that we convene to get today to ask the question, are we ready to talk about cure in cancer? I'm incredibly pleased to be joined by my colleague, Kristen Massachesi, who heads up late stage research and development at AstraZeneca Oncology. And also we're putting on this session in collaboration with the cancer support community. And I'll get a chance at the end to introduce Elizabeth, who you can see uh, more specifically, uh, Elizabeth Franklin, who's the president of the cancer support community. Um, Cure is our North Star. Today at AstraZeneca and indeed across the oncology community, there are hundreds of trials aiming to try to improve outcomes dramatically for patients. There are thousands of patients uh, that are receiving medicine in the real world. And, 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 and while each of those studies we tend to analyze in terms of statistics and medians and means, every individual patient within those trials, every individual patient receiving the medicine in the real world is hoping that this will translate to cure. And I think we have reason for hope. We've made so much progress in the early stages. We see progress in technologies to be able to have early detection, early identification, and progress in the science, progress in the delivery, but there's so much that needs to be done. We need to advance science more. We need more screening. We need to ensure that equitable or equity in the delivery of those outcomes is also something that we focus in on. And it's for that reason that collaboration is so essential and conversations like this are so key. We're on the cusp of ASCO which in one week's time will have an opportunity for us to learn about some of the latest and most important advances in the oncology space. And I think that it is within that context of on the eve of the latest practice changing data that it's perfect that we're having this conversation. So as I mentioned, I'm joined by Elizabeth Franklin, who's the president of the cancer support community, along with a, a, a group of other very, very wonderful and impressive experts who are gonna be part of the program. Elizabeth spent two decades advocating for and working directly with people impacted by cancer. Elizabeth, it is really a pleasure to work together with you and the cancer support community on this event. And I turn it to you for the next words. Absolutely, thank you so much, Dave. I really appreciate it. I wanna thank AstraZeneca for inviting the cancer support community to collaborate on this event. We are thrilled to be here to talk about the concept of cure, but I want to explain a little bit more about the cancer support community and why we're interested in this topic. So CSC, or the cancer support community, is the largest professionally led network of cancer support worldwide. We have 175 locations across the country where, in a pre-pandemic time, patients walk through doors and receive services. So they talk to social workers, they go to support groups, nutrition, 
cooking classes, yoga, education, networking. It's really the home away from home for people impacted by cancer or the home away from the hospital, the home away from the clinic where they can go. And we often hear from patients that it's like a weight lifts off their shoulders when they come into a CSC. These days we're providing all of our services via Zoom, but we have found really innovative ways to reach out to patients and connect with them. So we provide our services in three main ways. Beginning in 1972, when the cancer support community, then the wellness community, um, and we've merged with the organization Gilda's Club since then, uh, began, we started providing those direct services. So we have more than 500,000 visits from people impacted by cancer every year. We provide $50 million in free services, all of those things that I listed before. Um, and so we're just thrilled to be able to learn from patients, to support patients, to really come to um, where they are and have them come to cancer support communities to ensure that no one faces cancer alone. And we truly believe that community is stronger than cancer. For those patients who can't come in person, we also have a helpline. They can dial, talk to a social worker, talk to a licensed professional, a resource navigator. We connect them with any resource or service that they could possibly need. And as you can imagine, over the last year, this has been more important than ever before. Our call volume has gone through the roof. We've expanded to seven days a week. Um, we're helping with financial navigation, really anything that, a, that someone impacted by cancer might need, social and emotional support services, you name it, we can provide those services or connect patients and people impacted by cancer with someone who can. We also screen for distress. We find out if people are dealing with depression, anxiety, all those things that come along with a cancer diagnosis. And we have an online platform called My Lifeline where patients can go onto this website and share their story, ask for help, um, have people sign up on a helping calendar and really connect to others digitally, which over the last year we figured out is more important than ever. So however patients want to receive services, we're there for them, whether it's in person one day, um, over the phone or online, we provide a host of services for them. We also conduct leading edge research and we advocate for patients' needs in Capitol Hill, state legislatures, wherever decisions are being made to make sure that patients have access to the services and resources that they need. So today we're talking about cure. Cancer has come further than, than it's ever been before. The funding, the urgency that we've seen um, produce tangible gains in oncology, but cure means different things to different people. So that's what we're here today to discuss. And I'm really excited to introduce Ron. Ron Winslow is, uh, has been a fixture in the oncology community as a former Wall Street Journal medical reporter for over three decades. And Ron brings a great deal of experience and insight to our panel. And we're so fortunate to have him here today. So Ron, I will turn it over to you. Oh, thank you very much, Elizabeth. Those very nice words, appreciate it. And uh, welcome to all of you who have tuned in. Thank you very much. During my career at the, at the Wall Street Journal, uh, <clears throat> I spent uh, some 25 years, it was my privilege to spend 25 years covering efforts by academic researchers in the biopharmaceutical industry to develop new treatments against diseases across the field of medicine. And early in those years, uh, the oncology landscape was pretty barren. Uh, drug research, or at least clinical drug research, was largely about testing different formulas of chemo, conventional chemotherapy in very small subsets of patients with all too familiar results, a few extra weeks or months of life and a few extra, often accompanied by a few extra weeks or months of suffering from the effects of the drugs. Frankly, not much to write home about. In the mid 2000s though, that began to change. New knowledge about the genetic underpinnings of cancer led to drugs targeting mutations that drive tumor growth. And for some patients, melting the disease away. This was the rise of what we now call uh, precision medicine. Advances in immunology led to other drugs that unleashed the power of the immune system against tumors. And that has resulted in prolonged remissions for thousands of patients who were at death's door. But cancer is a wily foe. And as so far, these advances have provided sustained benefits to only a relatively small minority of patients. 
But as uh, you've already heard from uh, our, our speakers today, these uh, developments have infused oncology with a level of enthusiasm, energy, and hope that I think is unprecedented in the careers of many of the stakeholders in the field. A lot more work is ahead, but here we are talking about whether and how to talk about a cure. Is this important, relevant information for doctors and patients as they uh, take on their treatment? Or is it taboo, like approaching a pitcher with a no-hitter in the seventh inning and wishing him good luck? These are all interesting issues of how to address this question. My mother <clears throat> was diagnosed with early stage breast cancer at age 65 in the early 1990s. She was treated with surgery and radiation. She died at 90 without the cancer ever coming back. So was she cured? I would say yes. She was never convinced. She approached each annual checkup with trepidation, certain that doctors would find the cancer had returned. And the radiation apparently scarred her lungs and left her uh, with some respiratory uh, issues that accompanied her for the rest of her life and may well have contributed to her death. So, you know, where does she fit into the whole cure debate? As a science journalist, I work hard to avoid the term cure, especially in discussing results of new treatments. I also sort of shun breakthrough and game changer. These terms kind of overhype mislead and are too often used before the real evidence is in. It seems to me that cancer-free, in remission, stable disease seem like more accurate ways to describe uh, the progress uh, we're making with treatments and to provide a status report on the disease rather than a verdict or a conclusion. <clears throat> and as Dave mentioned, another issue is access. Is a treatment curative if because of cost, access, or other socioeconomic factors, Many patients can't get to it. To what extent should broad access to a treatment define its status as a cure? All of that said, cure is obviously the ultimate hope for doctors and patients dealing with the disease. On its face, cure would seem to mean the cancer is gone, eradicated, not coming back. But cancer is complex, and so is treating it and living with it. As we shall see, doctors and patients alike see the word from different perspectives. So we have a terrific panel of experts here to take a deeper dive into the topic. So let's get started. Here's how this is gonna work. We have two debates focused on different aspects of cure. These are not point counterpoint debates in the traditional sense, but more discussions that reflect different vantage points. In the first, Dr. Spicer and Dr. Popat will talk about and explore how cure should be defined. And in the second, Dr. Cole and uh, Dr. Franklin will discuss issues around how to hold discussions with patients and their families around the issue of cure. Following the debates, all of our speakers, including <coughs> Dave and Christian, will gather in a, uh, will convene for a panel discussion that will explore the issues further. And we do hope to be able to take questions from the audience. There's a Q&A function um, on the screen and you could submit questions uh, at any time during that. Before we get to our panels, we have a short video to bring in the most important uh, vantage point of this discussion, and that is uh, the views of cancer patients themselves. So uh, can we roll that montage, please?
I'd like to thank uh, those patients for taking the time to express their views. And uh, they certainly made us uh, all look good so far, uh, confirming how different uh, a patient's experience um, informs their view of the word cure. So, uh, well, let's get right into the first debate here with uh, Dr. Spicer from McGill University and Dr. Popat from Royal Marsden in London. Uh, Dr. Spicer, let's start with you. What, um, how do you as a surgeon define cure uh, of cancer? Thanks, Ron. Um, it was just interesting to see a lot of those uh, perspectives from patients. I can say perhaps right or wrong, for decades when patients have been coming into uh, surgeons' offices, I know it's true in my practice, um, the question of cure, the idea that perhaps by removing the tumor surgically, uh, that they may be cured is at the top of the agenda. Um, obviously, it's, it's a little more complicated than that, even in the setting where we, where we think we can cure, where we have high rates of, um, of having the ability of removing the disease completely and it not coming back. Um, when we see patients after surgery who are having their periodic scans, I, I, I totally um, recognize a lot of the, the feelings that were echoed in those statements from patients. Enormous anxiety um, around, the, around the time of the scan, has their disease returned? And then there's a the whole issue of living with the consequences of, of the treatment, um, you know, that we put under the umbrella of survivorship, which is, is really about um, packaging all the loss that comes with cancer treatment, um, the, the, all the impacts it has on their life. Uh, we sort of put a nice umbrella term of calling it uh, survivorship, and it, it's not all fun and games. I think patients go through a lot, uh, even when they're uh, considered, whether they consider themselves or we consider them cured. Sanjay, you have a, what might you add to the, to the question? Yeah, thanks, Ron. It's, it's very complex, and I think cure means different things to different people at different stages in their life. Um, I think uh, if we're talking about a uh, younger person, the word cure means something very different to a very senior uh, person. So if I think about the younger uh, person, we tend to think that cure means complete eradication of the disease with it never, ever to come back question is, is that ever possible? Uh, is the biological process that caused that disease going to cause that disease in the same organ again? Or is that uh, original cancer going to come back? Uh, how far do we push to eradicate the disease as best as possible? What side effects do the patients have to go through to eradicate the disease to live as much of a normal life as they would want to or could do? What impacts does it have on important family dynamics? Uh, finding a partner, uh, having a family. Uh, these are all really important asset, uh, aspects. Uh, at the other end of the spectrum, if I had a, a very senior 90-year-old, that 90-year-old would have a very different view on what cure means what their prospects are for the future, what their prospects are for their personal life, for their family life, what they'll want to take on, what the risks of treatment they'd be willing to put up with for the trade-offs of the benefit that it might afford or not. So I recognize completely all the comments that were said on the video because I see that day to day in my everyday practice and I'm respectful of all of those issues. Uh, but ultimately, I think cure means different things to different people at different stages of their journey and at different aspects of their life. Yeah, I, you know, it's interesting. Uh, it's hard to imagine. I, I deal mostly with patients who have lung cancer. I had a 30 year old in, in my clinic not long ago. Uh, she happened to have a small tumor that was found incidentally uh, through a, a body scan that was done. Um, it was a very small thing from my perspective. I wasn't terribly worried about it. I, I performed a, an invasive surgery, removed it completely. Um, and it turns out that it's a, it's a tumor that harbors a, a genetic mutation that, that we have medications for, but that might also influence what her chances of having a recurrence or a new uh, tumor develop. 
somewhere down the road. You know, she's she's in her 30s. We hope she has many, many, many years to live. And and it was so important for her to for me to tell her uh, that that she was cured. And and it's a very difficult um, conversation to have because certainly we removed all that tumor. Um, now we have to figure out how to surveil her. Um, and, and I don't know whether she'll have a, a recurrence or some new thing develop down the road. She has a lot of time for that to happen. And she has a, a lot of reasons why she doesn't want it to happen and a lot of, on the line. Um, so it, it, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Uh, we really struggle with this. A, you know, there is this sort of uh, you're cured, but there's always that but uh, that's sort of out there hanging in the air that, um, as you say, is leads to, you know, a difficult and uh, probably important conversation. Yeah, I mean, when I trained as a as a general surgeon, we had a, a patient with appendicitis. We removed the appendix, and they recovered. The conversation of ever having appendicitis again is is not one <laughs> that we have, right? Um, on the flip side, someone gets a bacterial pneumonia. Uh, we we can treat that with medications. It goes away. They can get it again sometime down the road, but the implications aren't quite the same as when we talk about cancer. So um, it, it really is a, a discussion that is individualized to the patient and, and the context. Uh, as Sanjay said, you know, what, what the patient is living with, um, age, a lot of other factors too. Sanjay, we, I think it's kind of a common definition that people think people are cured or say people are cured if they're disease-free for five years. Uh, what's magic about that? Or is it uh, not all that magic and um, not, all, not as meaningful as people might think? I, I don't think it is magic. Uh, we pull that figure out of uh, thin air for historical reasons. And uh, that in itself creates some problems uh, because by and large, if your disease hasn't come back within five years, the probability of it coming back uh, is, is quite low. But again, it depends on the type of disease that you're treating. And, and Ron, as you know, cancer is many different hundred types of disease. And uh, whilst the majority of cancers won't come back uh, beyond the five-year time point, there are some that can do. And we need to be mindful and cognizant uh, uh, of that. And part of the problem that we have is our inability to accurately predict the future. And that's what our patients like us to try and do as best as possible. And we want to do as best as possible. We want to take the statistics of what happens to a group of the individuals that are in front of us and personalize those statistics to the one unique individual and their cancer that we're seeing at that time and understand whether the five-year time point is important for them or really whether that's a metric that's not important. And actually, maybe it's a 10-year horizon, maybe it's a 15-year horizon, maybe it's a 20-year horizon. There are different diseases that behave differently. And of course, one of the problems that we see is as we get further and further away from the original treatment, the worry still persists, uh, both from the oncologists, actually, and the, the patients. Uh, and we find it very difficult to say, you know, look, this is the end game. You know, we are have now done the job. This is not going to come back. We try to say that as much as possible, but there's always a level of uncertainty. And I think, you know, that that weighs heavily on everybody. Uh, I'm sure Jonathan would, would would agree. It can be sometimes quite quite difficult to to say, look, you you don't need to worry because we don't know what's going to be around the corner. So okay. these uncertainties are quite quite problematic sometimes. What, what, what I think is particularly exciting right now is although we've been talking about curing people in the early stage of, of the disease for, for quite some time, we seem to be seeing people living five years and beyond who first presented with metastatic, you know, stage four uh, cancer. And uh, they, they may still have signs of the disease, but they're under control. Um, are they cured or not? It, it's, it's hard to say. But in, in cancer, in oncology, one of the, the things that we've been held to a very high bar of performance, and this, this five-year thing is, a, is an important issue with the idea of uh, allowing new drugs, new treatments to be approved and, and uh, be accepted as, as providing benefit. And that's not the case for an antibiotic. Uh, 
you know, an antibiotic isn't held to uh, the overall survival, five-year survival benchmark. It's held to its ability to kill that bacteria. Um, and that has all sorts of implications with bringing new therapies to cancer patients. Um, that high bar brings cost issues, uh, these, these, the lengthiness of implementing new therapies that are um, major, major uh, issues in, in, our, in our area. It occurs to me that, you know, we think of curing cancer as a sort of global enterprise uh, aimed at wiping out the disease entirely. Uh, you guys are not necessarily in the business of curing cancer, you're in the business of curing patients and treating patients. And I wonder if this sort of global uh, goal is, uh, you know, a daunting thing to put in the exam room or in the, you know, in the doctor-patient conversation and and instead sort of focus on, on and, and, and as we're learning cancer, as you pointed out, Sanjay, it's hundreds of different diseases. So there's hundreds of different cure possibilities in a way is instead of the sort of global campaign. What, what do you make of that? Yeah, and I, I think you're absolutely right. You know, we have to individualize uh, the aims and objectives of what we're doing in a shared manner with our patients. You know, we have to share, set our shared goals shared objectives, what do we realistically think is going to be possible, what do we think we need to do to get there. And you know, uh, Ron, I've been a specialist now for nearly 15 years, and I've just seen cancer just change be beyond what I'd ever expected it to have done uh, when I started as a young junior 15 years ago. We have uh, raised the bar so high, as uh, Jonathan said, and we've delivered uh, in many respects, but we still have lots of challenges. We have still lots of challenges to, to, to go, but we have to personalize our care to the one individual that's in front of us to make sure that the shared goals uh, that they want and we can aim to deliver and achieve are possible. And as you said, you know, patients living for long periods of time for many, many years is now a realistic possibility. And I never thought I'd see this in uh, uh, the time period when I started as a young junior. It's great. I have to say that echoes every conversation I had with doctor with can you know with oncologists. So over the past couple of years of being at the journal, they all said they've never seen anything like it in their 20, 25 years, 30 years career. And it, it's sort of that that yeah, there's there's still uh, a lot of work to be done, but. The fact that you know there was sort of this plateau reached, or not plateau, there was just this sort of milestone reached where things started to happen and go in the right direction after so many years and decades of frustration. Um, yeah. It's certainly an interesting time. Well, uh, Sanjay and Jonathan, thank you very much uh, for opening our discussions, and we're going to move on to debate uh, number two uh, with uh, Craig Cole and Elizabeth Franklin. And the idea for this one is to sort of bring some of our earlier discussion back into uh, a, a context of how do we address these questions? What's the best, effect, most effective, and most uh, caring way to uh, sort of address these issues with patients? Um, so uh, Craig, how would you react to the uh, initial discussion here and put it in the context of how you deal with your uh, your patients. Yeah, um, thanks, Ron. And you know, when when I go into a room to talk to a patient um, that you know has a a disease that is that has a potential of curative intent, it you just don't you know walk into a room with a a journal and say you know read this it's curable. Um, you really do have to take a, a, a bigger perspective of, of and just like uh, Sanjay and, and Jonathan said, you know, what biology does the person in front of me have? You know, is, is the biology they may have in tumor X, but is, is the biology and the performance and the presentation really fit um, what the papers say? And then um, what is their access? What is their access to care? Um, if they're unable to get to the, the clinic um, um, you know, for their, their treatments, um, is their disease curable? 
Um, you know, I unfortunately have seen patients who have succumbed to their disease, not because of biology, but because of access to, to care. Um, and were they able to receive their, their treatment? Or were there other comorbidities that, that stood in the way? Um, and those comorbidities can be personal within the patient. Um, they can be other issues outside of that. Um, if, if, they're, if they have to not buy groceries because the medications that they have um, are, are expensive, you know, I, have you really cured somebody um, when they can't re afford their medication? And then uh, I think kind of the most important thing are, is to really is the, the goals of, of, of what a patient and the provider want. Um, and when I see my patients, you know, I'm, I'm sure to sit down with them with a piece of paper um, and, and I use paper um, to, to, to write down things for my patients. Um, we write down the goals of, of what we actually want to achieve. Um, because just like uh, Sabine said in the, in the montage, you know, some patients you know, look at cure as, as gone for now. Um, and other patients look at, at cure as the complete elimination of disease and I never want to come back. Um, and so sitting down and, and talking to the patient and especially listening to the goals of what they, what, what, what is their goal of therapy, um, and then do the best to try and meet that in the partnership. Um, and, and the culture that the patient comes in with. I mean, uh, all of us are in some way bicultural, um, that we have the culture that we grew up with and that our families um, kind of interacted with and the culture that we live in. Um, and many people have to dodge and weave and negotiate between two cultures. And sometimes the definition of cure in one culture may come in conflict with the definition of cure in another culture. And so, you know, taking a, a, a social history and understanding and asking that, um, asking, you know, what is your goal? You know, what is your goal? What's your family's goal? Of, 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 your, of your therapy, you know, all come in to, to be very important in having that conversation. Elizabeth, I'm sure you've uh, experienced many of those issues in dealing with uh, your constituents and colleagues. Uh, what, what do you um, want to add to the conversation? Absolutely, it's, it's interesting being in a debate with Craig Cole because I love every word that comes out of his mouth. And I was gonna say with um, Jonathan and, and Sanjay as well, if, if and when I'm dealing with cancer in my personal life, this is the, the team of doctors that I want at my bedside, right? Because walking into a door with someone impacted by cancer, whether it's the patient or the loved one, they walk into that room as a person first, right? They're not a patient first, they're a person with a full life with values and needs and preferences that they care about. And so we often talk about patients as cure at all costs and care at all costs, right? And so you may have that patient who says, doc, give me the most aggressive treatment. I don't care how I feel, I wanna get back to my life. You also may have a patient who says, quality of life is the most important thing to me. I've, when I was in a hospital as a social worker, I worked with patients who absolutely would not lose their hair. Under any circumstance, I will not lose my hair. I'm not, I'm not doing the therapy if that's what it means. And so that may seem silly to some, but it's extraordinarily important to others. And I think for um, Dr. Cole, culture plays a huge role in that. So you have to really walk in the door, understand what patients care, understand what their cultural, cultural background is about. And we've often used the word hope. I saw that word in the montage as well. And you have to understand what patients hope for. And it's incredibly important. Sanjay kept talking about sort of the change over time. Patient hopes change over time. On day one of a cancer diagnosis, most people are afraid of losing their life. Six months later, they might really care about quality of life and not wanna live in pain or have nausea. Um, and then when they're facing the end of life, their hope may be for a good death and that they're able to say goodbye to their loved ones. So it's important to follow patients throughout their trajectory to understand what they really care about. Again, not as a patient, but as a person, first and foremost. How, how do you address uh, patients who 
um, who don't really want to hear the word cure used? Or, um, I mean, how, how does it work? Uh, maybe Dr. Cole, in your case, or with patients, or, uh, you know, do you find that come up in conversation? It was actually mentioned in a couple of the patient uh, uh, comments in the montage. How do you, what do you, how do you respond to that? Yeah, um, absolutely. Um, that there, there are definitely patients who, who when we say that we're, that this treatment is with curative intent, um, and they're like, well, what does curative intent mean? And it means that, that we're, we're willing to, you know, are you willing to, uh, to accept a certain level of risk um, and discomfort for now for possible benefits in the future? And that's kind of another you know, trick about a lot of this you know, cure is something that lies in the future. Um, and that is very difficult, I think, for, for patients. And so I'm very, you know, cognizant and very careful with, with that when I'm one-on-one -on -one with the patient. That, you know, if you're saying that something is, is curative, that you really have to be prepared to, to deliver on that. Um, and also, just like Elizabeth said, is being able to react in real time to you know, not say that we're going to do this therapy to the, the very end and be not aware of the, of the circumstances surrounding a lot of that therapy because things change all the time um, and patients change and our goals change. And so reassessing that in real time at, with every step, um, the patient I just saw before I came in, you know, we're treating him with curative intent but I made sure that before we started the next cycle of therapy, that our goals were in line, um, that the, the side effect profile was in line with his, his eventual goal of, of cure. And Elizabeth, what, what did you find the, the most important or the most telling sort of way patients um, react to this word? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because every patient is different. We've talked about that throughout both debates. And you have those patients. I've talked to people who say, give me the data, right? What is What are the chances I'm going to be alive five years from now? I want to know the stats. Show me the New England Journal of Medicine article. I'm all in in the science. You have patients who say, I don't want to hear a single percentage, right? Don't give me the data. Don't give me the stats. I'm unique and I wanna be treated as such. And why, that's why it's so incredibly important for physicians to understand that when they walk through the door. And as I'm he hearing each of our um, physician colleagues speak on this, this panel today, I also realized that you know, they're such an important source of hope. Patients look to the physician to give them answers. And, and it depends on how the patient wants to receive that information and how much information, but Physicians um, really serve as a source of control for the patient in an otherwise uncontrollable position, right? And so it's so incredibly important, the words that come out of physicians' mouths, the words that come out of nurses' mouths and social workers' mouths, because they're truly words that harm irreparably, words like there's nothing more that can be done, right? You can't bounce, bounce back from that. Yeah. versus we're going to do everything we possibly can. And I want to know exactly what you want to get out of treatment so that I can be your partner on this journey. So it's really understanding the individual patient and what they're hoping to get out of it. Oh, great. Well, I'd like to thank um, all four of you for uh, um, a great conversation. And uh, we'll prepare shortly to go into our bigger panel. But right now, we're going to hear a few words from Christian from AstraZeneca. Jonathan and uh, Sanjay, uh, uh, Craig and Elizabeth uh, for your participation today. I, I really, really enjoyed this, uh, this session. I, I'm Christian Massacesi. I am a senior vice president uh, uh, heading the late stage uh, development uh, at oncology at AstraZeneca. So I, I think this debate about the cure of cancer has been uh, uh, Lightning. I, I really want to thank you again because uh, you offer such a different perspectives and uh, you dissected this, uh, this concept that is uh, so complicated uh, and, uh, and uh, I think so, so important to everybody of us. To me, this is also very personal. You know, uh, the term cure uh, would have probably meant something entirely different when I started practicing oncology in, in Italy 20 years ago. Uh, you know, Talking about, uh, I think this was touched uh, by, by some of you, but talking about cancer diagnosis 
with my patients and their families at that time it was, uh, was a very difficult balancing act, I have to tell you. Uh, even more recently, I, I, had, I had the chance to thought very deeply about this concept of cure when, when a close family member was diagnosed with cancer. My uncle was diagnosed with, uh, with cancer and given the spread of the disease, uh, the life expectancy was about six to nine months. This was uh, six years ago. And uh, the word cure did not even enter the discussion at the time. However, my uncle today is, is not is not only alive, but is currently cancer-free. So, of course, this is thanks to the advancements and to the novel new oncology therapies that provided a, a, an incredible and unexpected benefit to him. But uh, the, the real question is what has been touched also before is, uh, can we say that is cure today? Uh, probably we cannot. Because I think the science and, and, and the current data, the current available data are, are, are not telling that for, for sure, for certain. I think Sanjay, you, 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 you touched this point, but uh, I think what probably we know, what I do know is that uh, uh, it, it, those treatments have given him six years, six years more in his life. Uh, it was a meaningful life. So, you know, as an oncologist, uh, uh, I know that providing this meaningful time to patient is probably our ultimate goal. And as a researcher at AstraZeneca, our ambition is uh, to develop uh, treatments that can provide meaningful time to patients and, and ultimately that can lead to cure. So how do we approach this? Of course, uh, treating cancer early is one of the critical ways of uh, making uh, probably this happen. Uh, we try, we use uh, new approaches. We want to detect, we want to intercept the disease earlier so we can treat the disease earlier. But we are also facing important challenges when we are in this setting, in early, in early disease. For instance, one example is uh, the big effort that we need to, 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 to do of using new endpoints. We need endpoints uh, to measure benefit that can have a quicker readout because otherwise, we risk to delay bringing a critical therapy to patients who can benefit today. Then unfortunately there are, and there will be, cancer patients with two advanced diseases for which probably the term cure may not be achievable. But I think it's still our mission to transform their care and continue to bring new options to them because this matters to them. Overall, uh, based also what uh, what Ron you were telling, I think uh, we we can say with confidence that in the last year we made huge progress uh, as a cancer community, and uh, and uh, and I'm sure that uh, probably in few additional years we will be here reflecting on today's discussion and be proud of how much more we have achieved. So Ron, thank you again. Uh, all of you, thank you again. And now looking forward to participating in the panel discussion. Thank you very much. And indeed, uh, it would be interesting to learn uh, what we've actually, you know, what progress we've made in the last year in some of these areas of cancer, because uh, we've been so dominated by the COVID issues uh -huh. that I think a lot of research um, in other areas of medicine and especially cancer have kind of gone under the radar. So. That would be interesting to hear more about that. All right, we're going to uh, launch into our broader panel discussion. Uh, this first question is for Sanjay, Craig, and Dave. And we'll start with Sanjay. What do you believe to be the biggest challenges to cure today? And uh, please keep your responses to a minute. And before you answer, Sanjay, um, to the audience, uh, you can submit any question you might have through the Q&A function. So uh, please uh, hit that if you can. Uh, Sanjay, what, what, where, where are the challenges for you, or the biggest one? So the biggest challenge I think in achieving cure is picking up cancer at an early enough stage in its natural growth for it to be able to be eliminated forever. And that can only be achieved in many cancers through cancer screening. So, as an oncologist, I treat patients with advanced stage four disease all the time. And you know, nothing upsets me more 
than seeing patients in whom the opportunity to pick up a cancer earlier has been missed for whatever reason. And we have this opportunity to pick up cancer early through cancer screening. It is the one biggest thing that we can all do as human beings to improve our chances of cure. So if you ask me what that one issue is, it's picking up the cancer early and implementation of screening for cancer to pick it up before the patient knows it's there. And that's certainly one of the big areas of innovation um, in liquid biopsies and early detection in the past uh, couple of years that uh, could supplement the, the screening programs we already have. Uh, Craig, what is your thoughts on this? Your yeah, I would, um, I would say that it's access um, and, and equal access to the, the, the innovations unto everyone. Um, you know, do you really cure a disease if you have people who are, are, are left behind with it? Um, you know, have we really cured smallpox, which, you know, which every, which I think we've had it cured, you know, since uh, I think 2020, oh, uh, 2001, but there's still people that have that disease um, because of access. And so I, I would say that the, the thing that, you know, keeps me up at night um, is, does everyone, you know, benefit from the, the clinical trials that we're doing today? Will everybody have access to that? Dave, how do you look uh, at this issue? Well, I think as a starting point, and I agree with, with both Craig and Sanjay on their comments, I, I think what I see is the optimism that I want to start with is that neither of them have questioned that the technology, the data will be there to be able to actually uh, combat the cancer. And so I, I, I'm, I'm, I don't see any more the biggest challenge being the uh, the science. I actually think that I have optimism that the science is going to actually uh, win the day here. I, I do agree, and perhaps it's my bias within sort of what I spend my time on every day, but I, I think it's how do we make sure that what we can do either in labs or in the clinic, we can deliver, for lack of a better term, in the real world. And I do agree. I think screening is kind of number one on that list for me. And I think that um, access is, is probably number two, uh, just in order of chronology, uh, that we've got to go through those. I do think that there's a, a, a third that to my mind kind of gets to a point that Elizabeth made. She had said, uh, with some levity that she, she, she had hoped that our panelists would, 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 would potentially be her team. I think that it's important to also remember the delivery of all therapeutics. It's multimodality. It's not just about a therapy. It's it's you know it's surgery together with radiation together with what I think was being articulately talked about survivorship and nurse navigation. And I I think that you know not to make light of it, it's a team sport in terms of how we provide individual care, and that includes the people that are around the patient. So I think that's all factors into how can we get the outcomes in the real world to reflect what we see in the trial. That, that I think, is the biggest challenge. Thanks very much. Uh, for our next question, we'll bring in Jonathan, Elizabeth, and Christian um, in that order. Jonathan, we'll start with you. In your area of expertise, uh, what action do you see as a priority in terms of improving the chance for, for cure moving forward? Yeah, great question. I think um, sort of Sanjay and, uh, and Craig said it with the idea of, uh, and Dave with the idea of screening, early detection, access to molecular testing, no doubt, uh, extremely important. But I'll give you a quick story about a, pa a couple of patients uh, that I've treated recently. Uh, one, one was a patient who was treated on a trial, received a preoperative immunotherapy. I operated on him, complete resection, uh, complete response to the preoperative treatment. So really there was no, the disease had been completely eliminated by, by the, the immunotherapy. And I'm seeing him a few months after, and he is just completely depressed. Um, I'm telling him, look, you, 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 we've been able to cure this disease. Uh, I, I don't understand. Tell me more about what's going on. And 
after further investigations, he, he was unconsolable. And it turns out that he had developed an immune-related adverse event and developed some hypothyroidism that was unrecognized, which can cause depression on its own. And now he was living with this uh, consequence of treatment. Another patient, similar story, um, who's cured of her cancer, but living with long-standing uh, consequences of the of therapy. So. It, it, I don't think it's specific just to my area, but one of the things we do in oncology is we keep adding more and more and more uh, treatments because we have a, a tough beast to, to tackle. Um, but I think de-escalation of care, finding ways to uh, remove certain things that aren't bringing benefit, finding ways to limit the adverse events that are incurred by the treatments is, is vitally important. And, and that can only be achieved through these ideas of early detection, molecular testing for precision therapeutics, and, and the endpoints issue of, of finding endpoints that allow us to remove things that aren't helping uh, earlier and adding things that are faster. Biology is hard, huh? <laughs> uh, Elizabeth? Um, sure, yeah, to put a finer point on everything that's been said so far, which I agree with, I would say that there actually is no such thing as cure without equity period, hard stop, right? We cannot cure cancer for some patients, and we know who those patients would be. They would be wealthier patients, more highly educated patients. We would see people of color being left behind, immigrants, people who speak a different language, the folks who are often left behind by the healthcare system. I don't want to see a system of haves and have nots, and I worry that when we see this rapid innovation, it's going to benefit a certain group of people in our society. And so I want to make sure that when we talk about cure, we are absolutely talking about cure for all and not just cure for the people who have access to it. And so I think it's extraordinarily important to think about cure in that context of cure for every single person who walks through our doors. And Christian, what is your, uh, what is your view on the challenges? You know, you know, Ron. Uh, my my job today currently is uh, developing cancer medicines. This, this is what I'm doing, and there is one thing that I uh, I believe we have uh, uh, learned. We are learning from this uh, devastating uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. We have seen an incredible response of everyone of every parties working together as fast as possible uh, to bring uh, you know, effective uh, treatments, vaccines, to patients uh, in, uh, in, in a time that was uh, not even conceivable before. 10 years before to develop a vaccine, we did it in one year to this time. So at AstraZeneca, uh, as an oncology community, we, I really would like to see us working with the same level of urgency. Because I believe that oncology is incredibly important. The needs are incredibly high. Uh, we need them, and we need to do this and not alone. We need to do this in an integrated approach. I think Dave was mentioning it is a team sport. Uh, and I believe that uh, if we are able, if we will be able to bring this level of energy and, 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 and concept of uh, integrated working together, I think we can progress things much, much faster. This is what I really would like to see and what I really hope that we will be able to do going are ahead. There, are there sort of some specific lessons or specific ways that, that the experience with the vaccine have, ident have identified that, that can be applied to cancer research, do you think? Absolutely. First, 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 first of all, we learned that we need to do what it is important to be done. So, and we are actually implementing this also in, uh, in our oncology programs, uh, uh, really being focused on the important question and try to get the answer for those questions. Secondly, I think, uh, and now going back a little bit to the topic of today, when we are thinking about cures, when we are thinking about uh, 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 aiming for uh, the, 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 the biggest uh, uh, outcome, uh, we are probably in a setting like early disease settings where uh, we are struggling with endpoints. So we are having uh, uh, endpoints, we are using endpoints uh, that takes too long to read out. And even when we have a very effective drugs, uh, sometimes it takes too long to, to, to run the trial and to have the readout of the trial. So what can we do better here? 
these are some specific example that, for instance, with a vaccine, all these emergency approvals and these uh, very quick readouts, ultimately taking some kind of risk, but ultimately bring the, 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 the treatment to the patients uh, very quickly. So we have a question from the audience, uh, for Craig and Christian. How do we achieve making trials in uh, research more diverse? Addressing this the access question uh, front and center, I think. In line with today's discussion, is diversity in clinical trials important when we're thinking about a cure in cancer? Oh, this, is, <laughs> this question is at the the heart. My, I bet you that's from my wife because I, I probably would ask her um, to like send in a question um, because that's so near and dear to my heart. And that was really, you know, kind of the, the, the point that I was going to make is that we really, it, in order to pick out the cancer cell from the normal cell, it takes an incredible amount of precision to be able to do that. And, and these new medications and the new fantastic drugs that we have are incredibly precise, but that precision isn't universal, universally um, applicable. And so we have to make clinical trials uh, with a diverse population in order to assure that this benefits everyone when it rolls out into the real world. To test it in one group of, of people, the easiest to, to accrue, may mean that it may not be applicable to others. What I always tell the residents and, and fellows and medical students is that when you look at a paper to talk about cure to a patient, you have to be certain that the patient that's in that paper is a direct reflection of the patient in front of you, or else it's not applicable. And you can only achieve that by diversity of clinical trials. And that is in the, the critical nature of that, I think, is making sure that the investigators are aware and prioritize that, that, you're, that it's not the easiest patients that you need to put in a clinical trial, but the necessary patients that should be, that you should um, offer a clinical trial um, and making sure the clinical trials are just not at the biggest institutions, diverse through all the communities that will have access to it. Ron, if I could just jump in on that, because I, I agree, it, it's such an important question. Um, I have the fortune of overseeing uh, lung cancer care in a publicly, health, uh, publicly funded healthcare system up here in Canada. We oversee about 2 million uh, uh, people in our area, and the geography is massive. Uh, it's uh, you have the landmass of Quebec, which is like uh, twice France, if you uh, measure it out. And, and we have all kinds of ethnicities and people represented. The Inuit, who are, who are way up at the top of the province, have the highest incidence of lung cancer of any ethnic uh, population in the world. And you can just I, I'm sure it's obvious to you how challenging it would be to bring any infused therapies, surgery, radiation therapy to people living in these remote regions. And that's within a system where, where everyone has equal access to, to health care, regardless of uh, income. Or, so, so bringing therapeutics, uh, regardless of geography, orally available agents, making things more easily administered is, is incredibly important, allowing for molecular testing to be performed in a, a lightweight way where there's there aren't too many barriers to get it getting done and extremely extremely important and it's achievable you know we've been able to implement reflex molecular testing here in Quebec for for not not very much money per patient it, it can be done Christian your thoughts on uh, uh diversity? difficult to add anything but uh, I can simply say we are taking this incredibly seriously uh, uh, we 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 want to develop uh, our drugs uh, uh, globally, and uh, I, I, I think uh, Craig said very very uh, uh, nicely. I mean, uh, there is a genomic diversity uh, across ethnicity, and you need to have in your clinical trials uh, uh, the, the the patient that represented the, these et et ethnicities, because you need to have the, the the answer. And I agree and I agree with Jonathan. It is possible. It is possible to, in, to increase the diversity in our clinical trials. We need, we need to find a way to, to, to do this better, definitely. But we are very committed on this. So we have time for one more question. 
Uh, so we'll uh, ask for Sanjay, Elizabeth, and Dave to take a crack at this one, which is given uh, all the energy that's been devoted to um, one disease over the past year in particular, where do you think money most effectively can be spent to make sure we get to a cure quicker? Sanjay? Well, I'm a believer in cancer screening. I've said it before, I'll say it again. Equity to uh, cancer screening is going to be one of the biggest uh, ways of curing more people. But it's not just screening through more scans. We've got novel technologies with blood-based biomarkers coming through. Uh, we've heard from Dave that science isn't going to be the barrier, and I'm a strong believer that science is not going to be the barrier. We have novel technologies. So I think access to early screening technologies is really where we want to be starting to uh, set the benchmark. Elizabeth? Yeah, I, I agree with Sanjay, but I'll take it even one step earlier in the process, and that's around prevention, right? If we can prevent cancer, um, but it's not that easy, right? We know some things that are really important to prevent cancer, eating healthy foods, moving your body, staying at a healthy weight, not smoking. Those things seem straightforward, but they're not. We're all human beings with a complex set of behavioral um, aspects to our life and different abilities and different resources. So we need, again, to support all communities to be able to prevent cancer, to be able to eat healthy foods and move their bodies and feel safe in their communities. And so this is a bigger health equity and social justice issue than just the medical and physical component of cancer. Dave, you get the last word. Oh, well, that's that's kind. I appreciate it. I, I think maybe just with the, the, the short time that we have, what I would say is I think there's an opportunity to connect with Sanjay and Elizabeth, you both just said there which is I actually think that screening and prevention, or at least some prevention can go hand in hand. This notion that actually, if we find risk factors where smoking is a huge risk factor for so many cancer types, and if we can find ways to effectively screen those portions of the population, but put smoking cessation together, even for those that are unscreened, I think that that's a practical way for us to begin to tackle some of the things that you've talked through. I, uh, I guess my last word on this is that I do think that there's been a lot of collateral damage from the pandemic in terms of people missing routine visits and uh, ignoring symptoms that they were otherwise showing up at the uh, hospital or at their physician's office. And I think we've missed uh, uh, as many as tens of thousands of uh, cancer diagnoses during the course of the last year uh, across the globe. And so I, I do think that it's important that we remember cancer didn't stop during the pandemic. And I hope that uh, if there's one action that people can take tomorrow on this is that they make sure that uh, they're directing their own approach to making sure that they take care of themselves because that leads to either uh, prevention or early detection. I think it's essentially important. So um, I appreciate Ron very much that question. Well, I'd like to thank you all for a terrific conversation. I'm thinking that uh, maybe we can leave that pitcher alone and spent with a no-hitter alone on the bench in the seventh inning, but uh, maybe we can bring the word cure compassionately and honestly and fruitfully into the conversation with uh, patients and uh, the community uh, going forward. So thank you all again very much. It was a great conversation. Thank you.